This is a fan-generated show. If you'd like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our new Rumble channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thrilled to announce the release of my new book, Obama's True Legacy, How He Transformed America. There's a reason why Mike Huckabee calls it a ferocious and chilling read. Order it now at Amazon.com or at FrontPageMag.com. Thank you, and may God bless you. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazoff Gang. Tonight, Obama's Russia collusion. With us this evening and back by popular demand, Jeff Nyquist, an expert in geopolitics and the history of communism. He is the author of many books, including his latest, The Fool and His Enemy. And he is a Glazoff Gang member. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Well, it's great to have you back, Jeff, and our book is out, Barack Obama's True Legacy, and you wrote a very uh, compelling, vital contribution to it in your essay on Obama's Russia collusion. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Any opening thoughts right now? Well, this book is so tremendous, uh, Jamie. I I got it, you know, and I wrote a chapter in it, but I'm reading the other chapters. And when you put it all together, they're painting a, a, a the most horrific picture of Barack Obama and his presidency that I have ever seen end to end. I mean, this is really an achievement because if peep, if you read this book, you will then understand Barack Obama. You'll understand something about the Democratic Party and about what's happened to this country over the last 30 years. And uh, it's absolutely what can I say? I mean, uh, Obama's a, a Marxist-Leninist when he's in college. That's your first chapter. The guy that went to school with him saw he was a Marxist-Leninist. You've got all the things down, just painting by the numbers, how this guy has supported communism, supported Russia, supported Moscow and Beijing, and advanced the communist agenda through his presidency, bringing Marxists into the Justice Department, using the Marxist alliance with jihadists to bring jihadists in everywhere, to support radical Islam that's been aligned with China and North Korea and 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 these 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 secret groups in Russia that have been uh, pushing this two-sided game, this two-faced game that, that Vladimir Putin plays. And that's what my article is about, about this switch that happened. In 2012, this magic act where they suddenly made suddenly all the democrats in the obama administration didn't about face all at once they were pro russia they were doing the russia reset they were helping russia build their silicon valley they were helping the russians uh but with the uranium one deal they were all doing that hillary clinton and obama they were facilitating the whole thing and then all of a sudden bam after obama gets caught on the hot mic being obsequious to president medvedev you know, I I can be more flexible when I get elected one more time. He's telling Medvedev on the hot mic. He doesn't know he's being listened to. And Medvedev answers him in English. I understand. I will tell Vladimir. Like and and the 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 intimacy of the hand gestures of Obama's holding, you know, the way he puts his hand gently on the Russian president's right wrist. It's like this is a, a formal meeting. These guys are very close in some strange way. And of course, what happens within three months, Hillary Clinton has this two hour long meeting, secret meeting, unscheduled meeting with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister in a side room. No translators, no American witnesses. Two hours. She won't say what it was about later. And all of a sudden, it just there's this about face. They go to this meeting in Geneva. And Lavrov and Hillary Clinton have this falling out. Lavrov is sniping at her, calling her assistant um, uh, a, uh, a, a minister of disinformation, uh, attacking uh, Michael McFaul, the uh, American ambassador to the U.S., calling him undiplomatic. I mean, just being insulting and provocative, they're, they're the Russian foreign minister. And just like that, the whole relationship just changed. And then Obama's drawing lines in Syria. You know, it's all about the Syria-Russia thing. And Obama, within a year then, Obama's posturing as anti-Russian. And it's a very interesting story. And then what happens when Hillary Clinton leaves? When Hillary Clinton leaves, 
John Kerry comes in as Secretary of State and he does the same thing. He goes to Moscow. Michael McFaul takes him into the Kremlin to see Putin. And then he goes off all by himself. No translator with Sergey Lavrov again for two hours. What is this two hour conversation? Very, And we know you could write a book about John Kerry just like this one about Obama. John Kerry and Obama are cut from very similar cloth. And so is Hillary Clinton. If you look at her Marxist connections in the background. So it's a very strange thing. And you hear Vladimir Putin tries to portray himself as a conservative, as a nationalist. But you go back and you look at what you look what Stan Lunev said about him, the GRU defector who came from the same place, came from St. Petersburg. What is Stan Lunev's first, first thing he tells me when Putin becomes president? Oh, I know that guy. He's a Marxist Leninist. He's a true believer. And then you listen to him talking and he says, oh, yeah, um, Mark, Marxism or Leninism is really just out of the Bible. It's the same thing as Christianity. I mean, Putin has made those statements. And he's he has also said he did never burned or destroyed his party card because he liked communist ideas. He has actually said this. And in 2017, Vladimir Putin gave the opening address at the at the uh, Festival of Youth and Students held in Sauchi in 2017 on the hundredth anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, and the Fe and the World Festival of Youth and Students is a communist. Uh, the this is a communist youth organization. This is the biggest one in the world. Every so many years they meet it usually in a communist country and hold their celebration. And guess well, last June it was held in uh, a year ago it was held in Beijing, and of course. Putin helped to arrange uh, Klaus Schwab to appear there, I understand. So it's like there is a communist bloc. Why are the Russians, you know, that the Cuba, communist Cuba, their legislature uh, voted thanks to Russia for sending them 25 million tons of wheat this year. They sent, I think, 21 million last year. They keep voting them thanks. They're building military infrastructure in Nicaragua under Daniel Ortega. And there's Russian anti-aircraft troops and Chinese in Caracas, Venezuela, the socialist regime there. So it, it's very funny when you actually don't look at what they say, when you actually look at what Russia's doing, supporting still the, the Russian transport planes never stop landing in Angola. The MPLA is still in power there, right? Jonas Savimbi is dead, the, the great anti-communist fighter in Angola, who was supported during the Angola war by Ronald Reagan. And then in Cabal, who controls Cabal now and who controls Afghanistan now? I think it's the Russians and Chinese and their allies control it. I think that they, I think that we never really understood the game. And when you, you look at these mullahs in Iran, many of them, the top ones, went to, to Patrice Lumumba. They went to Moscow State University. So... It's liberation theology, Islam, isn't it, in Iran? Isn't that what they were put like you got in South America, like you got in the in the Vatican with the Pope right now? Isn't he a liberation theology Catholic? Or is he, well, he's hidden it somewhat, right? He couldn't be one outright, be the Pope. But then you look at his policies. Well, then who's in the White House now? Oh, Biden and who was in Obama. See, there's been this stealth takeover. And how they affected it is, like the KGB defector Anatoly Galitsyn said, "You well, it wasn't just K Anatoly Galitsyn said they were going to make communism seem to disappear. It was, um, um, it was uh, uh, Georgi Arbatov, the head of the Institute of USA in Canada, who came to the United States in 1988 before the Berlin Wall fell down. He came to my school, UC Irvine, and gave a speech. We can look it up. They wrote it up in the New York Times and the Washington, I mean, uh, the New York Times and the LA Times. And he gave this speech and he said, we're taking away the image of your enemy. That We have a secret weapon. We're going to take away the image of your enemy. And what are you going to do without an enemy? Hmm. And that's what they did to us. And that's how we got Obama and the Clintons and Biden. And that's how we got, you know, Laura Richardson, the head of the Southern Command, she just she's made some excellent speeches. You know, uh, they, the problem is they get the, the this general in here. She's a woman. They want these women generals. Well, they can't do anything to her now because she's actually out there saying, look, the Chinese and Russians are taking over Latin America. Together. Chinese are leading the way. 
And now Russia has invaded Ukraine and they're getting artillery shells from North Korea. And the Chinese defense minister, what, just went to Moscow, I think, Mr. Li. And they're saying, well, the Chinese aren't admitting they're sending help to Russia. But it's believed that they are. Mr. Li's doing something. And you know what the Iranians are doing? Well, it's it's like there's a block of countries, right? We used to call it the communist block. And the rogue nations like North Korea and Iran are just right in there. So nothing's changed since 1991 except the name of the city of Leningrad and a bunch of street signs. And they they put up billionaire oligarchs that signed contracts with the KGB to front for a so-called capitalist uh, Russia. But it's still the same feudally organized, you know, um, mercantilist Soviet economic system because the Soviet system, all economic systems are capitalist. There was no the command economy was a myth. You, you run a socialist economy and you're in the Stone Age immediately. Socialism destroys economies. So you got to have some kind of market, whether it's the black market underlying the whole and everybody becomes corrupted by it, as has happened in China and all communist countries. Um, you have this, it's extreme, you know, communism is just so complicated and it's so complicated and it's been such a mess. The word has become so blackened that they want to give up, They the Russians wanted to give up that word. The Russian communists said, look, this word is killing us, communist. We got to get rid of KGB. This word is killing us. We got to call it something else. Then we can get a fresh start, right? Mm -hmm. But if Charlie Brown, okay, the cartoon character, we all know he's all lovable and everything. But if Charles Manson suddenly came out and said, I'm changing my name to Charlie Brown. Now I'm changed. Now I'm Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. He's not changed. He's still Charles Manson. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a neat trick. And it, it backfired on them to a large extent when they tried this. This was Gorb, part of Gorbachev's liberalization. And, you know, Vladimir Bukowski has written about this. Bukowski has said, look, the people will not like it. They'll call it a conspiracy theory. You know, but Bukowski said there was this plan. He sometimes referred to it as the Andropov plan, but it goes back much further. This lib false liberalization, they had it in the 20s with the change of signpost movement when they had this fake monarchist organization called the trust in moscow it was called the trust because they met in a bank and they made the whole the western intelligence services believe that they'd taken over the secret police and the communist party and the army and that that they were going to get rid of stalin any day now and it it, it was just a sham it, it was it was behind the nep lenin's new economic policy so they've done these deceptions before they just attempted it on a grand scale the problem was they lost poland they lost ukraine they had Georgia break away. They had the Eastern European because when anybody can get away from this thing, they do. And so all the structures they created and we, you know, in these different countries like uh, in, 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 in Czechia and Poland and Romania, you know, you know, Andrew, Andrei Kuduscu in the book, The Hole in the Flag, he said the, the revolution that overthrew Ceausescu was ordered from Moscow. Did you know that? Andrew Andrei Kudersky, the hole in the flag. You can read the book. And he found out by accident. He, he got up late at night and he started drinking with a Russian journalist. The Russian journalist said that they, Russian journalists had all got, gone there be, long before this huge group of Russian journalists had gone there long before the revolution started. And he said, why were you here in Transylvania in some remote, you know, where that revolution started? Why were you here that so long before? The Russian winked at him. And he said, you mean you guys in Moscow knew there was going to be a revolution against Ceausescu? And the guy winked again. And so people, he started putting it together, what happened in these revolutions. And you have the you have the same thing. Robert Bucard did a documentary on the Velvet Revolution. And he interviewed former STB agents and bodyguards of Vaclav Havel. And these body in this one STB agent, he said, I was this one student that died in the in the in the uh, Velvet Revolution, they gave me an airplane ticket to Moscow, but I didn't take it. They go and I, you know, he basically said I I pretended to die. <laughs> you know, it was all staged. We got the orders from Moscow. There's going to be a revolution in Prague, and all this has been nobody talks about it. There's this masses of evidence, but it won't ever appear in the mainstream press. And you have defectors like Galitzin, whose 1984 book New Lies for Old, he had 148 falsifiable predictions about all these revolutions that were about to happen. In 84, he wrote it. And 140 of those 148 falsifiable predictions, according to Mark Riebling, who studied it and wrote about it in his book, Wedge, I think Riebling still works for the who uh, Hudson um, 
Institute. But he, he's he, by 1994, that 140 of those 148 predictions have come true. You know, prediction is science, Jamie, as you know, as a as a person who studied and as a scholar. So, uh, you know, I follow this very closely. So the, the propaganda, the power of propaganda and disinformation is so powerful that this man here, you know, I know Mike Zulu, who did the, the tried to find out where Obama was born. And I asked Mike, I said, well, what did you find? He said, well, I, I said, I had sources in both the hospitals and Honolulu, and he wasn't born in Honolulu. And I said, well, where was he born? He says, I don't know. I have no idea. But there's something funny about Obama's birth and his, and he found experts who looked at that long form electronic birth certificate and said, these are forgeries. And yet this is called a conspiracy theory. I would be called a conspiracy theorist and, or a McCarthyist because because as you know, Jamie, communism is real. And the reason I know it's real is they tried to recruit me when I was in college. They were as real as can be. You know what? I'd be making six figures. I'd be in the government in Washington. I'd be rich and I'd be powerful. And I, goodness knows what the limit would have been for me. They were offering me. They loved me. Oh, you have so much talent, Jeff. You know, we could really, and it's like, I had, I said, no, I don't believe I was like a fly in the wall. I watch, I go, are these people real? It's like, and then finally I get taken out to lunch. And this lady says, they need a commitment. And I, th I was going to say, who are they? But then that wouldn't have been quite honest because I knew exactly who they were. Hmm. You know, and, and by the way, they treat the people that they cultivate better than conservatives treat young people hmm. and, and talent. I've, I've, I have to tell you that just as a person who's, they treat their people better. That's probably why they've been more successful. Jeff, um, I remember the people in the streets and the Soviet regime collapsing. It was a very, very happy moment for our family temporarily. And uh, I remember my dad was saying, if there's no Nuremberg style trials, something isn't right. And um, we rejoiced, the West rejoiced at the fall of the Soviet Union. And in the blink of an eye, we became the Soviet Union. It's, it's incredible how that worked because we thought we defeated communism. And then all of a sudden, Bernie Sanders and AOC and this whole mentality took over the United States. Then we had Obama ridiculing Romney. <laughs> the Cold War is over. You're stuck in the 80s. Um, very dishonest, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. It's very dishonest. You see, when Obama was caught on that hot mic in March of 2012 uh, with President Medvedev being very, very, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I'm going to give you what you want. I just need to be elected one more time. I need to just put up with these American people just for one more election. Then I can give you what you want. Please tell Vladimir. And it was, and, and that moment was caught on a hot mic. And yeah. people were kind of marveling at that moment. And so yeah. Obama had to trim his sails so that within a year, he, he had moved everybody. And notice these people who had the Russian reset, who'd helped Russia their whole careers. I mean, Joseph Biden, if you look at Biden, he postured as a centrist Democrat. But you look at his foreign policy, you look at Bukowski papers, one of the, the Central Committee documents that Bukowski has is a Central Committee document about a 1979, uh, a Biden-led a Senate delegation to Moscow. And he told them privately, I'm, I'm your guy, I like you, I just say bad things about you because I have to for my constituents back home. And this is in this memo. And sure. and Bukowski wrote a piece that I think was published on um, Breitbart, I think it was, in which he, he explained why this meant Biden was an agent of influence of Moscow. Hmm. That's in 79. And then Biden was supported, as Trevor Loudon will tell you, by the Council for a Livable World, which is a communist front. Well, let's get into that a bit. Everything that you're saying, Jeff, it's uh, it's very sobering. And, uh, you know, I'm always... I'm always uh, interested in how we're accused of conspiracy theory, you know, being conspiracy theorists, like, you know, the last couple of years, 
the people pointing at us saying, you're a conspiracy theorist, and they've got a hundred needles in them of boosters, and they've got a mask on, and they're standing on this dot that people told them to stand on, and they can't go anywhere without the 500th booster, and they're telling us that we're conspiracy theorists. It's just absurd. So even right now, how we would, what you are talking about, what we're gonna talk about in a minute, we're accused of being paranoid conspiracy theorists, but the evidence is right before our eyes, especially as the United States is literally sinking into a destructive cesspool. And it's just clear right before our eyes who's in charge now. Let's just step back just for a second here. Your essay in our book, uh, Barack Obama's True Legacy, just fascinating. Uh, I remember reading it, it's just every sentence is just opening your eyes and you begin to realize not everything is what you think it, it seems. Just as you say, the revolutions in Eastern Europe, I don't know about all of them, but some of them, but turns out the KGB is behind those revolutions. I mean, these things are planned years ahead, decades ahead by very, very smart people and, and uh, evil people, devious people. In your essay, the story begins, Obama is conceived by parents who were studying the Russian language. They met in Russian class. Yep. They and they were studying Russian in 1961. Why? Okay, uh, we don't have many hours here today, but we do know that they were very pro-Soviet parents. We know that Obama was mentored by Frank Marshall Davis. And as you point out, the evidence is, is there that he was most likely a KGB agent. And so all these puzzles begin to fit together. But there was a, there was a, a woman in a dinner in Moscow back in the uh, 1990, I think it was, early 90s. The Tom Five story, which is a big, yeah, I put in my article, my interview with Tom yes. Five, who is an American physicist. Yeah, so go ahead with that. This was uh, an incredible testimony. And even his son says that at that time, he came home and told him about this. Uh, tell us about this. Yeah, uh, Tom Five was a physicist who was working in Moscow in 19... 92, early 92, after the fall of the Soviet Union, he'd gotten involved in a joint venture uh, with a British businessman. And they were, uh, they had one of those venture capitalist things where the Soviet, uh, Soviet Academy of Sciences, now the Russian Academy of the Sciences, was working with them where the Russians have 51% ownership of the enterprise and the British and American partners have 49%. So and they were working on hand handheld devices like you know our our iPhones, but it was it was primitive then. It was for businessmen. It was for keeping addresses and doing things on a little device. So they were working on this, and um, they were at a dinner party in Moscow where a number of the partners were gonna they were gonna go back to the West, go back to Britain and America, and um, and the Russians have these parties where you sit around and someone says something and and they take a drink and then the next person says something and they take a drink and they go around like this and they're eating and drinking. And so this one American uh, engineer on this project uh, made a faux pas. And of course uh, he said something, but I didn't, I never realized how much Mongolian blood were in, was in Russian. So I saw, saw so many Mongolian faces and this offended a lady who was the wife of the head Russian scientist, and she was said to be a KGB, uh, you know, person, KG, part of the KGB, because they said she, the, the euphemism they said about her was that she climbed two ladders. She had her career with this group, scientific working group, but she also worked with the security services. So they were all kind of afraid of her. She got offended by this American engineer making the statement about Russians having Mongolian features. And she then lashed out at American racism. And then she said, she said, well, you're going to have a black president one day. And we have been grooming him and cultivating him for years. And she even knew his first name, Barack. And she said, Uganda, no, that's not it. And she said, he's, she's a, he's a chocolate baby. He's got a white mother and a black African father. And he's gone to the Ivy League and you will not be able to resist him. 
And so it's like, it's so, and of course he, as an American scientist working in Russia, he was obligated under the, uh, he was working with the Defense Intelligence Agency. He had to, he had security clearances and he was obligated to report this to them. He did, he, as he told me, he reported it to them and he had, everything was written down. There's a file somewhere in the Defense Intelligence Agency on this. And I don't know who, who has it. It could be somebody good or bad. I don't know. But um, this is a really um, important story because I had interviewed him. I spent hours with him on the phone before I interviewed him for my radio show. And the transcript is from my radio show when I did it with him years ago. And he, I had done, when I'd worked for Newsmax and World Net Daily, I'd interviewed a lot of people who did business in Russia. And he told me the same, the same story that they all tell you is that it's very hard to make money and you end up losing your money. And that 49, 51% thing is just a way of being robbed, right? And so they went through the same thing, his whole business story. It, it lines up with all the people that have done business over there, uh, except for a handful. There's some exceptions. Um, and he, um, so I, and he was very modest and very honest. And um, so I found him incredibly compelling. When I didn't expect to, I got to be honest, Jamie, this story seemed too much in alignment with, you know, when I hear something too much in alignment with my prejudices, I think, oh, they're just pay, playing up to my prejudices, right? Because I, I, I don't want to be prejudiced. I want to be, I want to find the truth. I want to be truthful. And when you said earlier about conspiracy theory, I have a problem with conspiracy theory, but I don't have a problem with it when it's conspiracy history, when it's established, when the facts are established. That's not a theory anymore. It's not a theory that Barack Obama was meant to a communist. It's not a theory that Obama brought Marxists into the State Department. It's not a theory that the Russian reset helped Russia to the tune of billions or that Uranium One deal happened. Those aren't theories. That's history. And then the weird thing about them all doing an about face and calling uh, Trump a Russian puppet after all their careers going back to the 60s and the Vietnam War days. Uh, you know, for Hillary Clinton, at least. I mean, Obama was too young. But and and all the things that Obama did to call for a guy that was a Marxist Leninist in college and has never publicly denounced Marxism, Leninism, for him to call uh, Trump a Russian puppet or for Hillary Clinton to with her background is really galling, isn't it? Well, Jeff, it appears that so. And this, this is, I mean, you show this, you document this. The, the Obama and his team, they're the ones engaged in Russian collusion, bringing in Marxism, working with the KGB. And then they more or less entrap, I don't know if the word entrap is right, but they set up this kind of sting operation, throw Trump in there, throw in a million lies and brand him, libel him and slander him with what they're actually doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing that what they've already done and been doing for decades, they put it on him. I was a very, I talked to a lawyer, a, a, a lady, um, Simona Pipko. I don't know if you know her. She, uh, she's quite old. She's over 90, but she met Stalin when she was a law student in uh, Leningrad in the early 50s. Um, and she told me that, you know, Stalin had this tremendous charisma, but Stalin had said to these law students, he said, if anybody accuses a Marxist of a crime or something wrong, the solution is for the Marxist to accuse them right back of the same thing. So you see, uh, it, it is the defensive approach that if you accuse a Marxist of committing an atrocity or being oppressive or being imperialist or anything, you just throw it right back in their face. So they were prophylactically, preventively protecting themselves because I believe they were all vulnerable in terms of their collusion with Russia and or China. Um, they were all vulnerable. We, we see with the Hunter Biden laptop we see there's some kind of connection between the Bidens and China, you know, and we see there's connections with former Soviet elements 
and mm -hmm. and present Russian elements. Right, Jeff. Just one second. So just to crystallize this, Ob um, excuse me, Biden is not just making money from Russian. Excuse me, from Chinese sources, as you show in your essay to the book. He's also making money from Russian sources, and he's dependent on both China and Russia, and he's also very subservient to them, despite this window dressing of helping Ukraine, because Biden's help of Ukraine, that's also kind of suspicious. He seems to be fueling the war on some levels. It's all very strange, isn't it? It is very strange. It's hard to figure out. Although I talked to somebody who was, when there were people in the Republican Party after the Ukraine invasion that wanted to, you know, get legislation, wanted to get some help to Ukraine. And as you know, Obama never gave any weapons to Ukraine. Never gave a single weapon to Ukraine. It was Trump that was the first one to give Ukraine weapons. And in fact, the exact weapon that actually stopped the Russian invasion was was the weapon that it for, was first given to them by by uh, President Trump. So, which was the anti tank weapon, the handheld anti tank weapons. Uh, forget what they're called. Um, but but it 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 it's very fascinating because this guy told me he said, yeah, a month after the invasion, you know, 20, 24 February twenty twenty two, a month after the invasion, he was in the White House and they were trying to get some kind of deal, and the White House was not interested in sending anything to Ukraine. It's 30 days into it. Now, this is a war that was supposed to be over in 30 days. Russia was supposed to win. Most military experts thought Russia was going to win. But a funny thing happened on the way to the Russian victory in Ukraine. They stubbed their toe. That wasn't supposed to happen. The The heroic Ukrainians held them off. And this put, uh, I think, Biden and Scholz in Germany and Macron in France, it put them in a difficult position because I think, I mean, Macron was already giving uh, military technology to Russia. I think a lot of Russia's electronic military technology comes from France. Um, and so, and of course, uh, Germany had that pipeline, you know, uh, that, that gas pipeline coming in through the Baltic. Um, and so it, it was very important uh, for these countries to keep the relationship with Germany. But this war made it impossible because... What have we drilled in everyone's heads? Two things. Russia and Putin are bad, and Trump is a Russian puppet. This was their theme. That was their alibi. That was going to be their alibi, and they wouldn't have needed that alibi except for that conversation Obama had in March of 2012. They needed that alibi because everything they were doing to help Russia and China, they didn't want to give themselves away, and but they didn't think they would ever have to do anything, any serious action against Russia. You know, most of these sanctions they put are on individuals. Imagine you're fighting Germany and you're not you're not going to blockade Germany. You're just going to blockade ships that are owned by Hermann Goering or Hitler or whatever. Right. You're only going to go after their bank accounts. You're not actually blockading Nazi Germany in World War Two. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you 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 know, so this no wonder the sanctions have not been super effective yet. But what's interesting is they got rid of Jackson Vanek, which really did inhibit Russian trade uh, when when Obama went for these the sa sanctions that uh, Bill Browder wanted. And that's a funny story in itself. And I think people are kind of misguided as to what's effective and what's not. And um, so there's a, there's these fascinating stories where things aren't exactly what they seem to be. But you you have to remember, too, that that um, the other thing that everybody has been indoctrinated in is that a, a, a military aggression is wrong. And Hitler was the big evil guy, the guy that kept invading countries, right? So we don't tolerate, since World War II, other countries invading other countries. We just don't allow it. Um, we, we don't stand for it. And, and, but if it's, a, if it's done on the quick, if like in Vietnam in 75, it just happens because we cut off their supplies of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and it collapsed, well, well, too late. It just happened so quickly. Nobody could. But when the war drags on and there's this blustery Russia that's threatening Finland and threatening Poland and the Baltic states. Jeff, if Trump was in power, Putin would not have gone into Ukraine, right? That may be true. Why did Putin go into Ukraine? I think there's a lot of reasons why. He had to because, well, first of all, if it's true, if what Galitsyn 
and some of these scholars have said, uh, I mean, there's a number of journalists out of Russia that have said that the Soloviki or the mafia that runs Russia now, they're a collection of the old Communist Party structures that want to bring the communist Soviet Union back, but they can't use the word communist. They can't use the word Soviet, but they want to put it back and they'll they'll put something else on it. I mean, you look at some of these generals. I just saw a video from the front line. There's a uh, a Russian general with a Soviet flag right here on the side of his uniform. Hammer and sickle, red banner right here. And you see those flags going up and Luhansk and Donetsk were openly Marxist-Leninist mini-states. And when you when you look closely at the Russian Federation and what they've done, the, there are these steps to bringing back the USSR. There was a Ukrainian, um, a Boris Chikole, who uh, more than 10 years ago, I think it was 12 years ago, wrote this brilliant paper about how the the much of the elite half the elite in ukraine was soviet and had kgb had gone to kgb schools and that um that the whole thing had been set up by the by moscow so that ukraine could be rolled back into the union in a fortnight this is what chikole said to me he said it's as if this this is what his study showed now he fled ukraine but what happened in 2014 was a good chunk of those KGB people in the who were basically running the Ukrainian system, when the Ukrainian people stood up in that um, that uprising in 2014, huge numbers of these people fled. Governors of provinces, the prime minister, the president, the country woke up and where's the president? He's gone. He's fled the country. They had to form a new government because because the president had used so much violence against the people in Maidan Square and in other places. Journalists murdered and left, or left almost murdered, bloodied by the side of the road, by the cars in the snow. People shot down in, in Maidan Square. Um, the, the basically, they had to flee because they they basically had acted in such a despotic way, such a despicable way, the Ukrainian people weren't going to stand for it. And so there was a, a change. In, and what they did very cleverly, the reformers, they would figure out that there were still a lot of KGB people, people there. In fact, there's talk in Ukraine of getting rid of the SBU. Jeff, I'm so sorry because our time is running out. Uh, this is just fascinating. I wish we had hours. I just want to make sure we touch on some things here. Sure. If you were to bet that when Putin rolled into Ukraine, that Obama was happy and supportive deep down or opposed that and was unhappy. I would bet that Obama was happy, that he's part of all that somewhere, and that Biden behind the scenes was saying, go, go in, go in. Am I correct? I think that that Biden's probably in a position where, where he probably d doesn't want the frustration of having to be in this difficult position but that he didn't have any choice once the Russians, you remember what Biden said in his press conference before the invasion. He said, well, if it's a little incursion, it's not a big deal. It's just if it's the whole big thing. So I think that was his wishful thinking because uh, look, I could just- But overall, Obama and Biden overall would celebrate and be supportive of the reestablishment of a Soviet empire. I, well, I think they would. Well, you see, you got to remember, these people are also selfish politicians as well. And I think it's more complicated. I think that they realize they want socialism to be realized in the United States. Mm -hmm. They want socialism to be realized worldwide. But uh -huh. they have got to think, well, what are they? What is Moscow's making a mistake? They should do it this way is probably what they privately think is this could be done better. Mm. This is my guess. And it's mm. probably they said, you know, and the reason why, you know, there's some of this blackmail stuff on Biden has kind of emerged. I think the Russians are sort of yanking his chain and saying, you got to help us more. And and Biden's answer is, well, if you expose me, you expose yourself mm. and you paid me handsomely, but you didn't pay me enough to cut my own throat because everybody here sees what you're doing is crazy. So, see, I think that there's it's complicated because a person can believe in Marxism and they can believe that, a, that Moscow is making a strategic mistake. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's possible. And I, I, you know, I look at Scholes. I mean, 
you've got the German police and the German military and the German intelligence services right there. If he becomes, I mean, like like the other social Democrats who are obviously Russian agents, right, Schroeder, you know, working for Gazprom after he leaves as, as chancellor of Germany, um, you, you, you've got a you've got a real problem in how how these how independent are they and how much do they have their own opinions mm -hmm. and to what extent are they are they themselves like a deer caught in the headline I headlight I don't know yeah but Jeff a lot of what's going on overall is that you know in one of those essays with John Drew you know he was showing Obama was Marxist Leninist they're discussing whether this revolution is going to happen but they want a Marxist revolution etc but Obama clearly figured it out through Saul Alinsky and other people, and he figured it out. Get rid of the long hair, get rid of the screaming, get rid of the turning tables over. Put on the tie and the jacket and have a clean haircut and mix in with them. If you want to destroy the middle class, become the middle class. And they figured out how to do it with smiles. And and we see everything that you're also discussing. There's just trickery everywhere in terms of did the Soviet Union really fall? Was there really a collision with China? That um, A lot of trickery going on, but they figured out also how to do it cleverly. And like you're saying, the communists in America are thinking, no, 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 you don't have to do this to scare people. The same way where a lot of people that want Sharia in the United States are against Islamic terrorism, not because they're against jihad and Sharia, but they know that we can do this more cleverly. There's an important distinction between communism in Russia and China and communism in the United States. The, the thing they have in common between Russia and the West is that all the communists in Russia and the West are denying they're communists. Obama denies he's a communist. Putin denies he's a communist. That's the mm. way the game is played now. But mm. the, 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 the curious thing is, is that the communists in Russia and in China, they want their countries to have more nuclear weapons and more missiles. The communists in the United States and the West want the West to be disarmed. Like Obama went for the zero nuclear option. He tried to push that. And Obama blocked the, the, the renewable nuclear warhead program, which Biden is the most anti-hostile to nuclear weapon president we've ever had. I mean, well, I think Obama was equally hostile. But it's they need desperately new nuclear warheads because we haven't tested or built a nuclear warhead since 1992. September 92 was the last time we had a test. Nobody knows if our warheads even work. And so that's an important distinction between the communists. It's very funny when the communists here are supposed to give up their weapons, the communists there are supposed to get more. And, and, and you see, this is, this is the part of the game where some of the communists here may think, wait a minute, do we really want to give up our weapons? And they might suddenly be thinking, maybe we want to keep our weapons. Maybe we can't trust our pals in Moscow and Beijing. And that might have been something that's happened or in the process of happening now. I'm, I'm being hopeful here um, because I think it's very, it's very funny game for the Marxists in, in Beijing. And see, just imagine this. Imagine if communism wins and they have a communist state in the United States and Russia and China and Europe. Now, what are the communists in China and Russia going to do? They're going to have nuclear weapons pointed at who, right? So is it really going to be the world is all at one? Or do they really want to dominate the world and not be the second and third strongest communist countries in the world? Jeff, so many, so many, so much smoke and mirrors. Um, the question I'm going to ask you right now, that's a five-hour answer. But let's try to end with that in two, three minutes. Let us suppose when those people approached you during your youth, I'm not saying you're not still young, but I think you were in college or whatever, and they had tried to recruit and enlist you. Let us suppose that they had succeeded. What are several arguments that you would be making on this TV show right now? Oh, gosh. Well, it, that's a complicated one. Yeah, I'd probably be trying to tell you that Russia and China are not a threat. 
that mm -hmm. America has social problems and we need to spend our money here and we need to help our people because they're starving children in Kentucky and Illinois and and we we need to uh, we need to get rid of racism and and sexism and don't fight Putin yeah i well you know communists actually the communist party usa is is saying that don't fight russia i mean the the the, the hard left is taking russia's side and don't fight China. China and Russia are unified against us, correct? Because it's our fault, because we're imperialists, right? You see, but but the thing is, is that if I'm, but if I'm told that I have to pretend to be a centrist, to hold power and to advance communist ideals on the sly, then now I have to say, well, we have to stand by Ukraine and we have to oppose Putin, and we have to oppose Trump. And if there's war with Russia, we need to arrest Trump and his followers and put them in camps, just like we did, just like the British interned all the pro-Nazis in Britain in 1939 when the war started, when World War II started. So we will have to, because these people are on the side of our enemy if we end up at war with Russia. See, there's a very important thing. If I'm a communist and I'm in the government and I'm in the White House and my opposition on the right is starting to take, has somehow been swindled into taking Putin's side and I can now posture as the patriot and they're the ones that are agents of a foreign power that now we're at war with. This is very dangerous. Goodness gracious, you know, sometimes it just all becomes so confusing and you realize, let's just pray to Jesus Christ, you know. Um, Jeff, uh, in the last 60 seconds, give us your words of wisdom. Uh, go read my website at jrnyquist.blog and uh, my words of wisdom. J-R- jrnyquist.blog, right? A-R-N-Y-Q-U-I-S-T.blog. Everybody go to Jeff's website, okay? 30 seconds left. And uh, you, we got to read because this is really complicated and strategy is like a language and it is a whole technical, you know, what I've been talking is very technical strategy um, that the Marxist Leninists have used since the Soviet times. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you don't really get into the history of it, you don't know it, you won't recognize it. It'll sound too fantastic to believe. Jeff, do you remember John Barron's first book on the KGB? Oh, I read it. I remember it very well. Oh, I remember I was reading and it's like, goodness gracious, they, these people are very clever and they're everywhere. And, uh, you found that out. Jeff, what, it's always uh, so pleasurable to speak with you, always eye-opening, very humbling, uh, sometimes uh, can get a bit scary at the threats we face. But thank you for being a courageous and noble truth teller in our world today. Thank you for contributing to our book on uh, Barack Obama's true legacy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody so much for joining the Glazoff Gang. You need to keep checking out Jeff Nyquist's website, jrnyquist.blog. Keep watching the Glazoff Gang and get Barack Obama's true legacy. We'll see you soon. Good night.